What did we say were the five key ways through which we add value in an organization? The right quality, right time, right place, and the right price. Exactly. So quality, quantity, price, time, place, and? Price. And price, okay. So basically, um, for Mark's sake, who has joined us today, last week's lecture it was 1.2. We talked about value added uh, services that procurement brings to an organization, and we say that procurement add value principally through the five rights, okay? Now, it's, it's very important that you understand how these five rights um, are used to add value as procurement practitioners. Now, five rights starts with quality, quantity, um, price, place, and time. Okay? Now, each of these is a, an extensive um, element of value adding. There are other ways that we can add value as procurement, but these are the basic ways that you as procurement um, practitioner is expected. The most prominent of these five rights is the price. And so you have to take time to understand the concept of pricing and as procurement, we've got two major concepts of price. The first one is the total cost acquisition, total cost of acquisition, and then the total cost of ownership. These are the two major um, definitions of price. Now, the total cost of acquisition is the, the purchase price plus delivery installation and uh, I mean if you, go, you borrow the money then int interest and so on. So the basic amount of spend that you have to make before you can take ownership of an item. The TCO, the total cost of ownership includes the total cost of acquisition and all the other pricing until disposal or the disposal costs. So everything, so what we say is that when you are evaluating the pricing of a supplier, you don't look at the purchase price only, because the purchase price is like a tip of an iceberg. You look at all the elements that are required in order for you to get value from the item that you are procuring and compare those. If you just look at the, the, the purchase price, uh, the example I like to give um, is depending on um, depending on the kind of uh, money that you have to spend on a vehicle, you may choose to buy one of the brands. Um, I know that the Cherry brand has improved, but those days when Cherry brand, Cherry is a small, uh, how many of you know the Cherry vehicle? You know that one, yeah. So if you, you compare that, the, the price, the purchase price could be very low, but the total cost of ownership is going to be quite high because the, you know, the spares were not so much available in the country and um, they, were, they were not so reliable uh, and so on. So you have to take into account the total cost of ownership. So you would prefer to buy maybe a Toyota than a Cherry. It will cost you a little bit more, but over time you won't spend uh, too much money trying to fix it when it breaks down. Okay, so these are the basic levels. And, and I think that there is a question that um, we give you in the assignment or somewhere to ask you to test you on this. If it's not there, I'll give it to you during your group assignments. Now, today I'm going to be changing focus. I'm going to talk about the concept of procurement and supply chain management. Now, this is a, um, not so much new anymore because we've been using this word for some time now. Okay, so let's look at supply chain. What is a supply chain? So we need to break down the whole term procurement 
and supply chain management. So we will look at each of these, okay, supply chain, and uh, ensure that we, we understand them. Let's start with a, a supply chain. Okay, that. <coughs> we know what supply is, right? When we say you supply, supply means the act of making something available. Now, it's important that you take notes of these things, guys, because when you start responding to the questions in the exam, you need to be able to define key terms. All these are regarded as key terms, and uh, the examiners uh, get impressed with you when you start, they see that you know the key terms. To supply is to make something available, or the act of making something available. And a chain, a chain is a, the chains are like a number of links in a process that help in uh, uh, providing something. So it's like I've, I've shown you here on the, on the board, you see the chain, with, uh, I hope you can slow my mouse now. It's a little bit, there's a bit of time lag here. So let me just do this, then you can see where I am pointing. Excellent. So you can see where the chain is. The chain is, is a linkage, in this case, of organizations, individuals, technologies, and activities and resources that are connected together to ensure the flow of information and goods across the different linkages. All right? So when we talk about a supply chain, a supply chain encompasses just all these organizations and activities that are associated with the flow and transformation of goods from the raw material stage through to the end user as well as the associated information flow. So that is the basic definition of a supply chain. It is a link of all these organizations, activities, and so on. And their purpose is to ensure the flow of information so within the supply chain, when we talk about the supply chain, we are talking about links which are, and these links uh, have to be connected. If there is no connection between individuals in an organization, and we, here when we talk about individuals within an organization, we are talking about the cross-functional team that you are managing. If there is no link or there is no connection between those, the chain is not going to hold. Now, at this stage, I'd like to introduce you to a concept called, when we talk about a supply chain, you should keep in mind the concept called theory of constraints. Now, this is a very big uh, theme. You can go Google it and uh, look at it. Um, it's, it's really not part of the syllabus. But when you talk about a supply chain, so and imagine this, these are my links. What will determine the strength of, uh, of this chain? The chain is as strong as its weakest link. You can have a very big chain that goes from one end to the other, which is pulling through a huge truck. But that chain will be the strength of that chain will be determined by the weakest link, which is part of that particular chain. Now, um, if you have to 
remove or to increase the efficiency of that chain, you must look at the area where the weakest point is and strengthen that point. So the theory of constraints in summary just talks about that you are as strong as your weakest link, as a value chain in an organization. And when you look, when you are trying, um, and mostly this is done by industrial engineers, when industrial engineers are trying to look at uh, the improving efficiencies in an organization, they will look at those, the whole value chain, and look at the areas in the value chain that presents weak spots. So what I'm saying to you is that there must be communication, there has to be linkages between all the different um, parts of the chain within the supply chain in order for this supply chain to flow properly. And that's why the, the concept of, we'll talk about management a little bit later, comes in because we have to manage these to ensure the easy flow. Now supply chains involves a network of individuals, organizations, we talked about that. A typical supply chain begins with the, the raw materials in the procurement and supply chain environment. A typical supply chain will start with uh, raw materials, the mining sector, and then it will go to other um, suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and eventually the end customer, okay? Now, the supply chain can be found within the three main industries. So when you have the three main industries, you can still identify a supply chain within those three main industries. And the three main industries that we have is the primary... Um, sorry, Justin. Yeah, sorry, Justin. Can you please move the pot to the right? Which one is your right? That way? Yes, please. A little bit. Yes, yes, thanks. Okay. Secondary and tertiary. Tertiary. Okay. Now, in each of these, you will find supply chains. Okay. Now, the, the primary industries are those industries that are, um, they extract raw materials in their natural state. So it's mining and agriculture normally. Um, even the uh, industries like the oil industries, um, the and so on, um, fishing, they get fish from the sea. Then the secondary industry, they take the, the raw materials they convert them to components plus assemblies. Then the tertiaries are these normally are the support, they are services like the banking sector, education sector, um, and so on. So you will find supply chains in each one of these. Now, the, the link between each of these is going to have a supply chain. So let's say this is a prime, P stands for primary. It's got a particular supply chain. And then you have this S, which is secondary. The secondary um, industries will also have a supply chain. But between these, you will have supply chains connecting to each other. And these are called supply networks, which is a supply chain within a supply chain, which, which supplies into each of these. They are called supply networks, and T-shirt also have their own. <coughs> That's a, a basic uh, drawing of what the, the supply chain looks like, starting from the extraction of raw materials, where you get from raw materials, especially in the, in the primary industry, 
uh, it is called where you, you, you get raw materials and they go into manufacturing. That like leg of the supply chain is called the upstream. You are going from raw materials into the manufacturers. From the manufacturers to the end customer, that leg of the supply chain is regarded and referred to as the downstream. All right. Then let's look at the concept. So we've dealt with supply chain, all right? Supply chain consists of all those organizations, individuals, and so on, who are connected to ensure the flow of goods, services, and information. And you can have individual supply chains within the different industry sectors. And remember, there are three different types of industry sectors, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Thank you, Mark. Let's now look at supply chain management. We dealt with procurement in the previous uh, lecture, so we'll concentrate on these other two a bit more. We'll probably highlight on procurement a little bit later. Let's deal with the concept of supply chain management. So, supply chain management, therefore, becomes the management of the upstream, that is from raw materials into the manufacturing organization and downstream from the manufacturing down to the end customer of those relationships. This is where guys online, I, I'm getting a weak signal. I hope you can hear me just uh, say something. Um, so supply chain management is basically you manage the upstream, which is supply of raw materials to the manufacturer and downstream of components or unfinished goods to the end customer. The management of these relationships that exist within the chain is called supply chain management. You manage the mining industry, you manage the refinery industry, you manage the processing industry, and so on, <coughs> until you get to the manufacturer. And that is a whole responsibility of the operations department within um, organization of which procurement and supply chain is part of it. So integration and management of supply chain organizations and activities is one function that supply chain management does. We also manage relationships and integrated business processes across the supply chain one important implication of supply chain management is the establishment of effective collaborative relationships. Okay? Re effective relationships with suppliers over time. Hence, we say supply chain management, SCM, is relational. You have to build relationships between your organizations and the suppliers. If you are sitting in, you are the manufacturer of whatever you manufacture, and you are, you are drawing from all these, sometimes you don't have a contract directly with the mining sector. Maybe you've got somebody else here who is a distributor. Mr. Distributor gets all these uh, guys everywhere and he supplies to you. Your role as the procurement and supply chain management is to manage these relationships to ensure that there is flow of goods and services. And you are sitting here as Mr. Bayer or Mrs. Bayer. It is your responsibility to ensure that the mine and the refinery or whatever, the processing plant, there is a good relationship. If there is no good relationship between the tier, I'll call them later on, I'll introduce you to the concept of tiering suppliers, okay? 
If there is a problem, maybe if you've tiered them up to level four. Tier four supplier who has a relationship with tier three, there is a breakdown of relationship. Ultimately, who is it going to affect? It's the buyer. And that's, that's make it important for you to manage these relationships across the whole supply chain. Are you together? Are we together, colleagues? Yes. Okay, thanks. Now, I want you to see this picture here. This is a comprehensive picture that demonstrates to you. I'm going to leave, I'll bring it back again, Moshe. I'll put it nicely. Then I want to go to the board so that you can see me. Now, what this picture is showing here is. Oh, you want to have it in your book? I don't think you've got it in your book. Um, uh, the slides will be available to you. Will be made available to you. I just want to explain to you the concept of supply chain management versus the procurement part of it. Procurement responsibility starts from where you ensure that raw materials are brought in into the organizations. They are shipped. You can see the next one is inbound market, but these are fairly small, so you may not be able to see that. Um, you have a picture? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't realize that. Anyway, so you have the raw materials and then the inbound logistics, and until the goods are placed, you brought them into the warehouse and paid for them. When they have been moved out of the warehouse, the process of operations management that kicks in. So manufacturing, um, outbound warehousing. Outbound warehousing basically means where you keep finished goods and ready to be shipped to the customer. And then outbound logistics, and then the customer takes over. So the whole process from the, um, the procurement of raw materials until the customer is satisfied is the whole uh, supply chain management process. And you will see that um, in some modern organizations today, they make the, the procurement function is not just procurement, it's procurement and supply chain management. It means you become responsible for all these elements. You, you may not be the one in charge of manufacturing, but you are responsible to ensure that the goods in the warehouse get to the manufacturing line. Okay? So that is... That what are some of the benefits of a supply chain management approach? And usually when they ask you about supply chain management, you will need to uh, give it good attention because it comes as a 25 mark question. It reduces cost by eliminating waste. How do you eliminate waste? Because you've got direct line of sight from the raw material manufacturer right until the item reaches you. And you also see how it is used by the end, end customer. Now, here is where the end customer becomes important. The end customer becomes important because you need to understand how much wastage the end customer is having from the items that you're procuring. Now, one of the, the flaws of procurement persons is that we don't pay attention to how our end users are using the product we bought for them. We bring it into the warehouse, into the organization, and how they use it, we don't care. But some of them, there's so much wastage with the items that we procure. And if you do not have a supply chain approach, and remember, the supply chain approach does not just end at delivery at the into the warehouse. It looks at how the items are used in manufacturing. If you are in uh, hardcore manufacturing, um, like non Fundo, who is from Max Steel, and I don't see her here today, uh, there is a lot of off cuts and um, I've been in these uh, steel kind of organizations where they, they if you go to the structure, you will find so much, so many off cuts from the products that you're procuring. Maybe the guys are not specifying the items correctly. When they bring in a raw bar, instead of bringing it three meters, they bring it four meters, and they only need three meters of it in order for them to do the manufacturing. 
it is your responsibility as procurement to do this kind of review. Hello, somebody wants to say something? Okay, so the supply chain approach helps you eliminate waste and waste activity. It improves responsiveness to customer requirements. Why? Because you know what the customers need, what they, what makes them happy, and you will be able to link it with what your suppliers are supplying. It gives you access to complementary resources and capabilities. Um, so when you are for a supply chain approach, and remember, we are looking at uh, the fact that supply chain is relational. Okay. If I have um, a cross-functional team member within my department who knows how to put together some uh, contract document, I will make use of that guy to do the contracting on my behalf. It enhances product and quality, uh, service quality, improves supply chain communication because we put direct line of sight from raw materials until the end customer. You share demand forecasting information. It fosters um, faster lead times and give you agile supply and then better communication. Guys, you should remember this and put a storyline around each one of these when you are examined. Okay. What kind of value do we add within the within the supply chain as procurement? Value within the supply chain comes from the effective management of the following. So remember, when the previous topic we talked about the five basic value-added services or through the five rights. Here is another value that you can add through the supply chain. Okay, when you effectively manage price, and the environment, delivery, sustainability, storage, communication, ethics, and quality, these you add value through the supply chain. Remember, it's slightly different from the five rights, but some of the five rights, you can see price, delivery, uh, quality is there as well. But when you manage storage, storage is also going to do with quantity. Okay, so you can basically find all of them here. Management of ethics within the supply chain is your responsibility. Okay, and I promise you, every member of a supply chain thinks that you, the buyer, are the holder of their destiny. And they try everything to try and influence you. You see, so you need, as a procurement practitioner, manage those good ethics. All parties within supply chain should work to the same legislative and ethical standard. If you are buying products from outside the country, you need to inform those members of those countries what kind of legal compliances you must comply to. In South Africa is unique. We've got triple BEE, okay? Broad-based black economic empowerment. By the way, when you have to respond in the exam or in the test or assignment about, and you have to quote triple BEE, you have to say it in full. Don't say it, don't abbreviate it. You need to ensure that they work to the same legislative and ethical standards. Okay? And normally, the tougher standards will apply. If you are dealing with a supplier that um, has got zero tolerance for accepting gifts, I know that different companies have different um, concepts about, about, about uh, giving of gifts to each other. If your, your supplier says that their, their rule is that they give zero gifts, and your rule is that you give gifts to a certain value, then the most stringent of those rules become standard across you, so that you don't compromise each other. Okay, so Mark, your company says don't accept gifts. My company says accept gifts to the value of 500 rand. Right? Then you and me, our rules of engagement are based on your rules. Then don't give me gifts and I won't give you, you nothing. So make, make sure that you all are, uh, because you see what happens is if we follow the tougher, the tougher rule of ethical standard, we are both safe. But if we follow the more lenient one, the other we compromise the other person. So it's important that we, we do that. 
Okay, I, I told you about the supply chain networks. Um, we can define the supply networks as a combination of multiple supply networks that network in a commercial environment and across link, linked organizations. So when you have um, networks within a network, they become a supply network. So the supply networks are usually designed around five areas external suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, logistics, customer demand, and so on. So when you remember we talked about the three levels of industry, which is tertiary, you remember that? Tertiary, uh, let's start with primary. If, if in the primary sector, this is the mining company, it's got its own, and then within um, in the refinery company you've got another type of supply chain that supplies into this one and of course it is both ways then this becomes a supply network or right, that supplies it is a network within a network um, and you can see it looks at external suppliers, um, manufacturers, distributors, and so on. So this is an example of supply chain networks. And let's look at how we can compare supply chain management with procurement, which I have, we have already almost done. Procurement is the process of obtaining goods and services uh, in response to a need. And then supply chain is the infrastructure, the chains are in infrastructure in physically getting the products and services delivered. Procurement includes preparing specification, monitoring, sourcing, buying, stock control, and then this disposal is about the stock control, the, the one that is in the warehouse, not the one that has gone to your end customer. So that whole process, the disposal of what gets rotten in your warehouse, part of that is includes procurement. But once it leaves the warehouse and goes outside, it becomes part of the bigger operations management approach. So within procurement, the process is complete when the product or service have been delivered, checked, and paid for. Okay? Supply chain management continues to the end until the product reaches the end customer. So that is a summary of what we've been talking about, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the complex network that I spoke to you about, the method of tiering suppliers. When you are, or OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. Original Equipment Manufacturer normally have the first level of suppliers that they call tier one. Underneath that, you have the tier two, and you can even go further down on tier three. Okay? But the higher the tier, the further away the buyer is to the supplier. And so, if you don't want to be too far away to the sub supplier, reduce the number of tiered levels of supply. Here is the reason why I always recommend that you have the most minimum tiers of uh, supply. It's because, now, if tier Say you've got up to, you are the OEM, okay? Original equipment manufacturer. And then you've got your next level of supplier, tier one, who supplies to you. And this guy has got subcontractors, and this subby has got another subby here. So this one becomes your tier two, and this one becomes your tier three. If this is the raw material supplier, imagine we are in the manufacturing industry, okay? We are here ultimately, we make cars, vehicles. And this guy is the one who digs out the iron ore. Iron ore from the ground. And he gives it to make acetometer. Acetometer makes um, the sheet metal. Then he takes it to our friends at Mark Steels. Mark Steels, they do profiling of the items. They cut to length. OK. 
Now, this character here, he's, he's having some very funny ethical issues, like slave labor, he's, he's getting, um, he's in parabola close to Mozambique, and he's getting some guys from across the border, and he's making them slaves. Uh, and you are the buyer here, you are sitting here. When there is a finding against this tier three, you as a buyer will have direct responsibility for that. And that's why I say when you tier, when you think about sub sub subcontractors, think about the idea that you will still have direct line of sight. The contract is between tier two and tier three, but you will need to see the terms by which and the ways of operation and when when i yeah it's it's always good that you if if you do not know the credibility of the lower tier suppliers go visit them yourself find out don't depend on hearsay okay or what, what you are told within a complex supply chain every supply tier is managed each has to conform to the same ethical and sustainable standards. The OEM will conduct supply audits on the entire supply chain network. Okay? It is your responsibility. The original equipment manufacturer will rely on tier one suppliers to ensure the lowest part of the chain is well managed. It is the responsibility of OEM to ensure each tier of supply chain conform to standards of, of legislation. And guys, um, there is no excuse. You can't say I didn't know. Uh, remember the story of the big uh, Nokia, how Nokia went down. It was because of an investigative journalist who went to DRC Congo and found that they were getting um, the source of the, um, this, there is a mineral that they put in the phones. The source was coming from a mine which was, sorry? The, the, so, the, the the mineral they put in there is cobalt. It's cobalt, yeah. It was coming from a mine that was done by youth, uh, child soldiers. And it came up on, um, I think Houston, that sounds like Houston. Uh, so, and it came out in the National Geographical documentary. The, the, the shares of Nokia just plummeted. And the rest, they try to go into the smartphone approach. You know, everybody, we used to have Nokia, if you remember yes. those days. But now, they just went under. Because of, well, I think one of the reasons is because they didn't adapt quickly to the touch screen. They had, you know, those things that press with fingers. But the other reason also was that they, they, their buyers did not do due do, do diligence on the whole supply chain network. And they should have known. Yes, they should have known and nipped it in the bud. Okay, let's go now to logistics. We're still talking about supply chain management and logistics is part of it. Logistics is the control of the flow of goods or services between the two points. It includes handling, packaging, inventory and warehousing and transportation. Materials management, on the other hand, involves activities that have to do with the input phase. The input phase is the upstream phase where you get into the manufacturing organization. External logistics are, includes the process that are related to turning the raw materials into desired end products, such as extraction, manufacturing, warehousing. So external processes include distribution and retail. All these have to do with the whole concept of procurement and supply chain management. Remember, when you talk about it, you have to refer to all these aspects of it, including demand planning, which is about knowing what is required and when it is required. Okay? This can be achieved by working closely with other organizations in the supply chain. Okay. Of the supply chain management, fleet management is a, the solutions on an organization uses the fleet management is the solution an organization uses to physically transport goods from one place to another. 
fleet can be the number of vehicles owned by the organization. Most of these fleet management are outsourced. A lot of companies today outsource it, but I know a few that will insource it because they want to, to be in control. The disadvantage of outsourcing is you lose control of when you can take the fleet or the vehicle to whichever place. Um, it is a serious decision that organizations have to make, and often one which is um, reversed over time, where they will insource again. Another part of procurement and supply, or supply chain management is uh, inventory management, warehousing and order fulfillment. So inventory management involves knowing how much inventory. Now inventory and stock are the same, so you don't have to bother about that. As well as being aware of inventory levels, okay? Now when you adopt a, a supply chain approach, you need to be aware of inventory levels as procurement. Now, like I said earlier, uh, the traditional procurement approach, if you just say uh, we are strategic sourcing or we are procurement, it does not give you the end-to-end -end view of the whole value chain. If you only concentrate on just sourcing items, contract with the supplier, bring the item in, keep it in stores, and your responsibility ends there. You do not have line of sight of what is happening with the items that have been kept in stock. Um, I know some of you can, can give examples of how much wastage there is in terms of, of warehouse stock because we, we don't pay attention. There is a segregation in certain companies. The, the stores and warehousing, are, if they report to somebody else, you know, but you have to have, the chief procurement officer must have a direct line of sight if you want to really derive value from the um, procurement and supply chain organization. So, so you need to be aware of inventory levels. Warehouses should be laid out in a way that makes product, product selection quick and easy. Take a, a walk um, in, um, in the warehouse, and you will be shocked how, especially if you are running perishable items, you guys uh, who are in the fast moving consumer um, goods, the FMCG space, take a walk in the warehouse, and some of your, your colleagues who are stores people, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't use the, 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 you know, the face in, first out, they, they just jumble stuff around, you know? <laughs> Uh, for some reason, most organizations they don't give value to the store man. When you when you are when you are strong and physically fit, like Mark is looking this morning, they put you in stores because you can lift stuff. You know, you can put it here, but you don't have the intelligence to understand. This one came in first; it must go out first. They bring the items that came in, and naturally, when you are packing in store. You go look in your pantry when you get home today, or the place where you keep food. Yeah. You will find, even in your fridge, you'll find the, the, the tomato sauce that you bought last month is at the back, you know? Because the concept that we have, uh, naturally, we want the things that we bought now to be presented in, because we're excited about this new buy, we want to use it immediately. But we don't make the ones we bought in the past, come forward and bring the new ones at the back so that you can use stock. Those are issues that you should introduce into your organizations. That's a value you bring into organizations as procurement and supply chain um, management individuals. So good warehousing design must include clear labeling, barcoding on the rack to ensure products to be found effortlessly. And those are products that are that need to be used at the time. If products cannot be found or are not in the right quantity, the distribution element of logistics cannot happen, and orders can be left unfulfilled. Uh, I started with this one earlier, and uh, we talked about this um, stock for inventory policy. It's a concept where. Um, pro, uh, an organization decides to, to create a, a, a policy that says they will keep 
stop. And it is because of these reasons. There are many instances where organizations adopt a stop for inventory policy. And these here are some. Number one, when you have independent demand. Okay, now when you have independent demand, you will don't have a trigger to tell you that your stock is running out. Dependent demand de um, de depends on something. You understand the concept of independent demand, guys? It's demand that is not linked. Not you, as you stone. You stone. Yes. You are forbidden to answer the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Any any comments? What what do you understand by independent demand? There are two concepts of demand. One is called dependent. The other one is independent. I'm going to pick on France. Hello, France. Hello, Nomfundo. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. Good, good. You can see where you there is an um, all. Make sure that you can see everything. Sit on there. Where there is a sanitizer. Okay. Yeah, just for social distancing. No, France is not answering. Helene? Um, when you think... Hello, Helene. Hello. Um, I think independent demand will be something that's sort of made to order. Yeah, I like the, your, your explanation. Made to order, yeah, because it does not have a, a trigger. For example, if you have, let me give an example in Porsche's world. You are supplying meals to your customer. You are in the catering industry. And you need to buy, uh, this is a piece of steak. It weighs uh, 70 grams. What will determine the amount of steak that you buy? Porsche? Porsche, are you still with me? It's the number of meals, right? Come again. The number of meals. The number of meals will determine the, the, the amount of steak that you're going to buy. So if you say you've got, uh, you've got so many clients who are going to eat 70 or 100 clients, so you know already that you're going to buy 7 kilograms of, of steak, of silver side. That is how it, so the, the, the steak is, it is dependent demand. It, it depends on the number of meals. Let's, let me go to the automotive industry. In the automotive industry, you are buying a car. You are a buyer for cars, okay? What would it, and you are going to buy, I mean, you're going to manufacture 20 cars, and you're going to buy the number of tires. How many tires are you going to buy for 20 cars? How many tires does it uh, have? Okay. Sorry? Eight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many? Thirty-two. Twenty times. Uh, how many? How many tires does it have? Four tires. Hmm? Four times two. Five. Four times two. 16, 20, 20 for 5. For 5 cars. You've got 20 cars. How many tires? 80. 80. Uh, 80. 80 tires. 
Eight. How many times? How many times? <laughs> Normally it's four plus one. You guys don't have a spare wheel. Oh. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Some guys don't have spare wheels. Let's take it four. Four tires. So the tires are dependent on the number on the number of of cars, right? So the tires are called dependent hmm? demand. What about the car itself when you are buying cars? What will trigger you the number of vehicles that you're gonna buy? You you're gonna procure. If you are say a, a dealership. Hmm? You need to sell it's sell sell information, but how do you know who, who will need what? Maybe think about it when you are a retail buyer and you are buying um, you are buying sugar on the on the shop on the floor. What will determine the number of sugars you buy? You don't know, right? So it's called like sugar and items that are dependent on customer demand are called independent demand. That's why for these, you, you can keep stock. When there is stable prediction for low items, you know that stable prediction will not lead you to obsolescence. When there is a long lead time, we spoke about this. Items are critical for operations, keep stock, legal requirements. You see the, the fire extinguisher here. This is stock we keep because we are required to keep appreciation in value when i can appreciate in value like those of you who drink wine apparently a specific type of wine that appreciate in value and so on all right material requirement planning um, is also an electronic system which can schedule orders monitor inventory and manage the production process okay so mrp systems can be used in supply chain management we are talking about the whole concept management and MRP system has three objectives to ensure that the parts of my, or materials needed for manufacturing and end products are available, establish when to place orders and schedule deliveries. The last point we will we'll talk about is enterprise resource planning. It must be the last page now because we are finished with the lecture. Okay, enterprise resource planning, ERP is another system. It is a computer-based system designed to process and an organization, so not an organization's transaction and facilitate integrated real-time planning. ERP is another buzzwords you need to get used to so that you don't get confused